Good afternoon. I'm Joey Livingston, and this is Dr. Jones, and we are here for our afternoon discussion. Well, Dr. Jones, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been. You're looking quite well. Well, thank you. Thank you. I like your shoes. Do you like my shoes? Yeah. Those are nice. Listen, uh, I am a very important man, and I don't have much time this afternoon. We've got to make equipment preparations, uh, so we won't be long, but... uh, Sorry, I'm just being silly. Um, yeah, but uh, but I thought we'd have a brief discussion this afternoon, and uh, and uh, then we're going to prepare for uh, um, our Texas studio and Ivan Rogers this evening. Um, tell me a little bit about Ivan. Have you spoken with him? I have. He is an amazing gentleman. Uh, he has quite the background, and I would advocate everything about how he is moving from A to B to C. He's not the kind of guy that is interested in fixed belief theology. Uh, he will tell you what he thinks, but he's he's very open uh, to a movement forward. And so I think that we're going to experience hearing from a man who is enjoying the journey, if you will. He's not interested in saying well everything that i say theologically is accurate he's simply saying this is what i have and this is what i'm talking about and i'm happy i'm content i have this wonderful wonderful sense of security knowing that i'm loved and he brings that to the table and i I think it's sometimes more important that we understand uh, how authentic a person is more than uh, than other elements, sure. And so he he brings that very much to the place, and he's an exciting gentleman. You know he uh, he's extremely honest. And I spoke with him a little bit this afternoon. He's got a very seems to have a very kind heart. He really does. I don't. And you know, I told him when he started sharing X, Y, and Z with me. I said, "Stop, stop. I love all of this." you know, as a first tell. And, you know, one of the things that I try to do with our guest, I try to allow guests to hear some things at the same time that I'm hearing them. I don't want to, uh, I don't like to set up the guest uh, at all. I, I don't like to prep out, and I don't want this to be theater. I want people to understand that what they're getting from us is not theater, but it's real. Sure. Uh, it's I think it's the makings of of a better way forward. Yeah, I agree. The, you know, theater is nice, but not if you don't know that you're watching theater. Well, true. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This morning, uh, you made a statement. You said, and I quoted you. Uh, you said that um, the Jews brought the adulteress to Jesus using the theology of sin. Correct. And when Jesus told the woman to go and sin no more, that he was using a case of metonymy. And well, I, I if I'm not mistaken, I, I said something similar to, similar to our use of metonymy gotcha. in English. In other words, when you examine the Greek, you're not going to find apples and apples. You're well, let me finish your quote okay, real quick, just for the purpose of conversation. So I misquoted you a little bit. But uh, anyways, uh, you went on to say... To finish that the quote, you misquoted. Go for yes. it. Yes, I'll try to... Have, hopefully, <laughs> I have the rest of it. I did fairly well. Yeah, uh, that's not I bad. edit in real time, because you, you spend a lot of time making a point, and I like to to share on Facebook some of the things that you've said. Um, you, you went on to say that... Um, in the Greek, what's happening is that you know he he had made an argument against the theology of sin, and when he was telling her to go and sin no more, he was telling her to stop using the theology of sin. Exactly. Right. All right. Go ahead. I I think that most of the time, people think, and this is the tragedy, and I've tried to encourage those people who are leaving. Uh, the theology, the theology of hell, 
don't jump into another theology of word for word translation models or theories because it won't work. If, for instance, <clears throat> I want you to picture if, and, and, and please help me nuance this a bit, uh, that would be a blessing for me. Hell isn't a small mistake in an English read. And it seems like people today are saying, oh, wow, it shouldn't be hell, but everything surrounding hell is quite adequate. Is it reasonable to think that you can make a mistake as large as inserting hell and everything surrounding sure, hell fine. is fine? Sure. No, that's not reasonable at all. That's not reasonable. And my point is... It should be a... It, it, first of all, it, it's it's a huge red flag when you when you discover that hell makes no sense. Not it doesn't even make sense in in a, in an English read, uh, but it makes absolutely no sense from the standpoint of the original languages. Um, and so to have such a huge flag come up, um, it, it's first of all, it's both both a relief to realize that, but also it should you should mark it as a sign that something is really wrong and it's not it's not so black and white you know it's like a it's like if you dropped a rock into a puddle it wouldn't just make a hole in the water there would be all kinds of of ripples and and in hell is in, is indicative of the of the method techniques information data etc that the translators had available when they made that translation for instance, if uh, lots of people are playing these swapping games, in other words, swapping participles for participles, that is, swapping Greek participles for English participles, and there couldn't be anything more tragic. It takes, for instance, anyone who starts studying Greek, one of the most difficult things in what we call Koine Greek is the participle. It doesn't take one or two years to understand the participle it takes a decade or two to even wrap your mind around how that works and it's it's still in question in various areas concerning a participle these things are not easy and those things we need to admit to and it's true that we might not be even close to many things in the read and we need to be honest enough to admit that. But unfortunately, what people are doing today is they are simply extracting the idea of hell, replacing it with another problem. For instance, most people are simply saying, well, you know, Gehenna equals the Valley of Hinnom because it was a replacement word. In a sense, uh, it was very exchangeable. Therefore, we're talking about the garbage dump on the south side of Jerusalem. That sounds like an easy sell. And that's what a used car salesman would do. But that's not the way that language works. If I said, and I read this morning and I wrote this down uh, in my scribbles, you're killing me. And now if I said, you know, you're really, really killing me, how would you restate that? Uh, it depends on the day that I'm talking to you. Exactly. So... If it's in the context of making you laugh, how would you restate that? It's, if it's in the context of um, I'm taking advantage of you uh, financially, how would you state that? Or you're taking advantage of me? You know, my, my, my point is we can't simply say, oh, let's just replace killing. Sure. It's not you're killing me. Yeah, this this no, uh, it this changes. It fundamentally will change. Cold approach to language implies that the people of that day didn't understand how to relax and enjoy language like we do. Right. So when it comes to metaphor, like you're killing me, it's going to take the reworking possibly of an entire phrase, maybe using many different terms like you're just, you know, you're making me laugh too much. That may be the equivalent that we're talking about. Now, when you look at that, it's not a word-for-word -word swap, is it? Right, because you're saying because it, you're talking about translating it into another language, 
into a culture in which Abs- uh, the the uh, into a, a culture in which the idea of murdering somebody does not let necessarily translate into telling them a good joke. <laughs> right now, I'm simply talking about swapping what we know to be true in English from this position to that position, right. saying the same thing within the same language. Right. This is even more uh, difficult when transporting from one language into another. And people are naive enough to buy books and support people who write books who have word-for-word replacements. This is why Philip's translation, I claim, oh, wow, you're talking about a, a book that should not be called a translation. It would be Philip's. It's, it's, it's a tragic work. And this is why in linear things of that nature, I despise them because what they do, they cripple people. They lead people in the wrong direction when it comes to understanding how language actually works. Now, the only reason that interlinears are used has to do with someone wants to identify the term and say, well, in the Greek, this English word is, you know, yada, yada, yada. And my point is, it's it's best to be honest. Pick up the Greek text. Either you can read it and understand it or you can't. It's just like the Assembly of God preacher who approached me concerning hell. We had a long discussion. with He and his uh, youth pastor were here. And he said, I've been studying this in the Greek for a long time. So I started questioning him in Greek, and he couldn't answer anything. And I, I was saying, you're studying the Greek? You've studied this for a long time? And so I pulled out my Greek text, and I started reading just various verses. And then I turned the Bible to him, and I shoved my Greek text over to him, and I said, can you read any of this and tell me what it means? And he couldn't even read it, much less tell me what it means. So to him, what Greek studies mean, it means that he's been studying commentaries, and he thinks that's Greek studies. Uh, That that is just so, so disingenuous. And so when you start claiming, making the claims that you're studying Greek, and you don't even know how to read. And please understand, most of the people who make the claims about there is no hell in recent books, the majority of them know nothing about how to read the Greek text, much less deal with the problems of that language. Now, there are various language problems here. We've got a reconstruction that's still going on in the language. We have reconstruction that's going on in the text. So many things are not certain, and I think God, I thank God, I thank God that Bob Graves is is here to ring the bell, and he will. He will send flags up the flagpole and say, hey, we're not there yet. We need to be honest, authentic, uh, and that's good. Sure. And so it's... It's true that in the uh, denominational world, you have people who are uh, very comfortable with pretending, and that's unfortunate. So, in a sense, what people do is they find that, oh, it's the love of God, love of God, love of God, and this is a wonderful subject to talk about, and there can't be a hell, and we normally use these same standard Bibles as a proof text to prove that there's no hell, we just lift hell out and maybe an eternal from time to time, and we we go insane with being language foolish. And I'm simply suggesting at the end of the day that does nothing but demonstrate our foolishness. It mm-hmm. doesn't help people. It, it gives some people a little bit of comfort simply because they no longer believe in hell. But that's... It's just another system that's quite deceptive, and it's not going to last long. This is why many of the Protestants you know, who believe that, in hell are just laughing. Um, and this is just my opinion, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that everybody who believes that there's no hell in a language-stupid way is insane. But there are those who insist on pushing forward anyways in spite of 
not knowing in spite of not understanding just feeling like it must be this way and they and they push forward and they push hard and they push and they push and they push and those people have lost their mind because when you move forward and you try to get your brain to operate off of a vacuum of information how can how, what else can happen besides gears start falling off right you know what I, I'm saying I was in an argument the other day and please understand what I mean by argument I'm not talking about a fussing match this person wanted to know and so what's your position I said let's just chat and so I thought that I would give him or her or possibly several different people in the conversation I gave them something to think about they said well prove this to be true and so I went back and made my argument from an English translation at the end of it I said don't get too serious about what I'm saying because this is simply an English translation I don't advocate what it says but here's an argument from that translation and so we can all read and hopefully we can all comprehend what translations say I keep contending that the King James Version has a certain kind of theology if you comprehend its theology it's mixed it's full of contradiction same thing it's true with the new english translation and the all translation english translations have thousands of problems and so my theology that i speak of was simply coming forth from the english model that i was using and at the end of the argument, I simply said, please understand that my position theologically doesn't rest on anything that I said here because I simply gave you a theology that came out of an English version. And this is what you're looking for. You're looking for something that comes out of one version or another. And unfortunately, some of you guys are mixing the versions to suit what you want to feel and sense. And so, in a sense, you can't be honest enough to say, wow, why can't I stick with one model and admit this is what one model says and let's look at another model of translation theory. This is coming from a different standpoint. People are not even willing to get that honest these days. What people are doing, they have a theology and they will grab and, you know, various translations and, well, in this this is right and another one oh this translation is right can you read the languages no I can't read the languages but this is right how do you know it's right uh, you know blah, 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 blah. you know it's just on and on and on it's just gibberish and so you know there I get questions all the time which is the best English translation that's not really a, an intelligent question uh, first of all translation models are not based upon the same you know text base they're not based upon the same theory that's like you know asking the question is that one over there better than this one over here well if you're using a certain theory of uh, of translation and you're using a certain text base how can you compare that to something that's using a different text base and a different kind of translation theory. How you, can you make apples and apples out of that? You can't. And so which is the best? Well, this may be best suited for this. And you can only compare translation models side by side and say which one is the best if you're using the same text base, the same, I mean, exactly the same uh, uh, model of translation theory. And, and please understand, all of these are synthetic, extremely synthetic. And I keep arguing that we're not being sensible, that is, authentic about being honest with what the text is. Our approach is not fundamentally sound. We do not make a valid premise. And this is why atheists have every right in the world to say this is nonsense. But unfortunately, they're using the same... Uh, mindset concerning uh, theology that you know most people are and this is where they stumble and this is I, I think that if atheists could actually look at the veracity of 
of what is and take out the clutter, I think that's when atheists will have a paradigm shift. And it's going to take some time. It's not an overnight thing that you look at. It's not like, well, show me, you know, how many dollars you have in your pocket. It's not as simple as that. And so I, I find that the educational process is uh, much needed. And this is why we are getting heavily invested in uh, bringing many scholars from all over the world who will be teaching various subjects. And we will be offering um, people a chance at getting a good education in a very solid way over the next few years. We are creating that. And I'm so thankful for all of those scholars who are more than willing to participate in this paradigm that we're putting together because it's going to be possible within three or four years for a person to get the best of an education uh, from the best professors everywhere for pennies instead of millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars. For instance, if you go to Harvard, it's going to cost you 150000 to $250,000 a year. And those same kind of professors will be teaching for us and be doing something for us for the value of intellectual honesty, educational honesty, etc. And we are going to fill in our audience as we go along. And I'm very proud of that. But back to, you know, the subject at hand, and I really did get off the subject. Uh, I do apologize. I, I, I don't think that we're willing, in a sense, to examine the text because I think that what it will do it will it brings up the idea of I don't know and I think that we're afraid of saying I don't know I think we're afraid of taking most of theology and saying let's put it into question and so when when you can say I make the claim of the first Adam and the Eve and I make the claim of God created the heavens and the earth you know, those things become extremely difficult when you first of all start examining the text because the text doesn't have, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have what you're looking for, what you're suggesting. And one of the things that we're going to do within the next, I think, three or four weeks, we are going to get serious about this Abjad talk. I've made a lot of comments, and I'm going to be very objective. I'm going to bring in to the, the table or to the table of discussion various examples of how an objad has been treated in various ways through a creative process by various people throughout the ages. And I'm going to show people what others have stated others about the same thing in the same context in various ways and we're going to do this so we can simply educate people to show them and to demonstrate them this is not an I said she said thing it's not about me it's about evidence we're looking for evidence we're looking for facts we're not willing to simply say oh just trust me because I'm a nice guy uh, because we have a show, trust me. I'm not asking for people to do that. I'm, I'm trying to teach. My wife and I are trying to teach people. It's best to be in an environment that supplies plenty of knowledge and then provides you the means to be able to think, and ask questions, and move forward. And that is, that is that is certainly our quest. It certainly is. I've watched you do that over and over again with people over the years. Um, I've watched people get upset with you because they thought that the knowledge you were providing was the things that you believed. Um, turns out it was just what they believed. <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest. I like with it when you. you teach people what they believe. Uh, don't get off on another tangent. We've got to, I to love close this uh, um, discussion. But uh, um, one day I want you to get into talking with uh, our audience about the difference between objective and subjective because they think they know they think they know the difference uh, but when you talk to me about it i i had to say well maybe i don't know uh, i was it was a fascinating discussion again don't get into that um but a little teaser anyways we have got to go and this guy has got to be quiet 
Uh, I love it when he talks, but uh, we're on a limited time schedule. Hush. <laughs> when was the last time that you had a haircut? Uh, it was recently. It was recently. I mean, yeah. it looks nice, but, you know. Oh, thanks. Okay. All right. Um, good talk. Uh, tune in at 630. Uh, our, um, our Texas studio is going to be discussing, uh, discussing, discussing this morning's teaching. And then uh, at, at uh, 8 o'clock... Ivan Rogers is going to be on, and it's going to be a, man. a great discussion yeah. with him, Dr. Jones, and Rhonda. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. We love you.
Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, once again, we're at the place. Um, this is a portion of the show that we call Dr. Jones' a student speak out. And uh, it's been a real blessing to be a part of this. It's just an opportunity for us to um, give back a little bit um, from what Dr. Jones has been uh, pushing our way, for which we're very, very thankful for. So um, we appreciate you guys following us uh, up until this point, and we hope you enjoy our show today. Um, I'm joined with my wife, who, who you usually see weekly, Nicole Furlow, and we've got a new face on the show tonight. This is my little brother, Thomas. Um, he's with us. We're missing a few tonight. Um, my mom and my dad are usually here with us, and uh, they do desire to be here with us t this evening, but had uh, prior engagements, so we have a sit-in. <laughs> but anyway, um, what we're going to do this evening is just kind of visit with ourselves as, as, as we have been doing week in and week out. Um, and you guys just listen in on conversation and uh, we hope you enjoy, but we're gonna start out by telling a little bit about ourselves, um, a little bit of background. Um, I was, I, well, I don't really know how to label myself the way I was raised. <laughs> um, I guess you could call it Pentecostal. Um, it's really a mixture, Pentecostal, charismatic, possibly, maybe a little bit of Baptist in there. Um, but I, I was uh, raised here locally in Texas to what was referred to as possibly a commune. It seemed very similar to one anyway. Um, just a small, small, small group that kind of lived out on the outskirts of town and uh, had a lot of rules and regulations that we had to abide by won't go into that a lot. Um, it's pretty pretty boring and, and typical of, of uh, communism. <laughs> but uh, anyway, very thankful that uh, we wised up and, and moved from that. And uh, I guess somewhere around the year 92, um, I, I, well, actually, I think my dad had known uh, Dr. Jones longer than that. He'd known Dr. Jones for quite a while, but I became acquainted with him around the year of 92, um, we started visiting his place of fellowship and uh, sitting under his teachings. And I'll say this, even, even back then, uh, 20 years ago, it was, I was blown away by the way he spoke, the way he talked, uh, the things that he taught, uh, even though then he had to be a little bit more methodical about it because there weren't a whole lot of listeners. Not a lot of people would uh, listen to him. And so he had to be very careful about the way um, the way he spoke, the way he taught, and uh, understandably so. If you've ever watched this show, there's a lot of controversy talked about <laughs> uh, that, that we go into. Anyway, um, we sat under him for many years um, and taught and learned and really unlearned first, went through the process of, of unlearning a, a lot of things, a lot of religion that we were brought up in, um, a lot of incorrect uh, philosophy. Um, but then somewhere around, I guess, 2001, is that when we met? This is the good part. Uh, 2003. <laughs> 2003. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere in there. Um, I, I work at a restaurant. I'm the manager at a Mexican restaurant. And uh, this young lady here walked through the doors, and uh, the most amazing thing happened. Um, you know, I'm I'm a pretty good-looking guy, you know, fought <laughs> off the girls most of my life. Not really. Um, <laughs> but this one walked through the door, and a thought passed through my mind um, just as quickly as I saw her. I thought, wow, this girl I might marry one day. And I don't know why that thought passed my mind, because the second thought that passed through my mind was, she's very beautiful, she's way out of my league. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, we worked together for a little while. We got to know one another a little bit and became friends and um, kind of progressed from there into what we called, I guess at the time, a courtship. We started the date and um, we hit a roadblock probably, what, two months into, about two months into our relationship. Yeah. Um, and that roadblock was at two separate churches. Um, and we were quite different in our, in our um, philosophy, if we can call it that. Um, there was just a lot of things that, uh, and, and we were both really heavily involved in, in the directions that we were headed. You know, she was a leader at her church, I was a leader at, at, 
at a, a, our church, and um, just pretty stubborn, both of us. <laughs> and when we started to talk about those disagreements, we realized that our relationship was progressing. Um, we hit that roadblock, and we decided, you know, if we're going to continue in a relationship, um, we're not going to do so going to two separate two separate places on Sunday morning to, to learn. Um, it's just not something that I desired, not something that she desired. And so we decided that we're going to just get the books. We're going to study. And when I say books, I mean book. <laughs> the one called the Bible. And uh, we got into quite a bit of discussion. Um, it seemed like for at least a year, um, at least four to five nights out of the week, we, were, we spent studying, just reading scriptures. I kind of feel like Thomas is the third wheel here. <laughs> well, we're going to get to him in a minute. <laughs> well, I was going to interject. You know, Thomas got to witness some of those discussions of ours. I remember he he was a little boy at that time, and he would walk up to Stephen's house and want to visit, and we were, I was in tears because I, we couldn't come to these agreements, and Thomas just wanted to come and visit, you know, and I remember you having to tell Thomas, now's not a good time, you know. <laughs> or he would knock on the door and he'd go, did I come in a bad yeah. time? <laughs> I'll be back later. <laughs> anyway, it was quite a process, but um, I said all this to get to a point. Um, you know, those that were, were watching us experience this, you know, I, I know I got a lot of applause for standing my ground and saying, you know, I'm not going to waver. This is what I believe. And I'm sure that you did as well, you know, just like, oh, yeah. yeah, stand your ground. You're not going to change your mind for any man or whatever, you know. We're just going to fight until we either decide this ain't happening or we come to some conclusions. But I hadn't made it in my mind that I wasn't changing, and <laughs> so did you. Yeah. And looking back on that, you know, I can't believe people were actually applauding that. It's sad that we just couldn't sit and have a civil conversation about the things that we thought we believed, the things that we thought we believed to be true. It was almost like we were coming together with all of our armor on, you know, and not willing to lay all that down and just express who we really were. And really who we really are as vulnerable people that are willing to change, you know, because that's what we've done recently. Um and over the years. And so had we just laid it out in the beginning, you know, and not been prepared for battle, you know, um, I think we would have come to some agreements a lot sooner. But yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy there for a little while. It was crazy, but it, it just, it makes me realize what most religion, most things taught these days, put the, the pressure it puts on you because had I continued to follow that mindset of I'm not going to change my mind, I'm not going, I'm not willing to back down, I might have missed out on the love of my life. I might have missed out on the one that God made for me and and, and I for her. I, you know, I could have missed that opportunity because of the applause that I was getting for being so hard headed. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 amazing, but uh, I I just take what I have and I appreciate it very much because. Now it's a wonderful testimony um, that we actually did come to terms. And since then, you know, she, I, I can't say that I would have given in any, but she could see the validity in some of what I was saying. And she made a decision to leave her church and come join me, very thankfully so. But thank God, since then, we've both grown and matured. <laughs> I didn't stay where I was then either. I had a lot of growing, a lot of changing to do, and still a, a lot of unlearning to do because of that, those old ideas that I had. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's amazing the, the things that, that we've overcome. And uh, I say all that, just a little bit of uh, background, like I said, but... I say it more in appreciation to where we are now. Um, I'm so thankful that we don't have to experience those things anymore. We can look back on them as uh, living and learning. You know, this growing, just that growing process. We started out in a terrible place, to be honest, <laughs> but definitely have grown and matured. And I was about to say that we started it in the perfect place, 
and I guess you could look at it both ways. Yeah. We were both, um, you know, steeped into religion and that sort. But at the same time, we were both ready to throw things down and to grow. And, you know, as far as us meeting at that particular time, um, since then we have learned so much together and we've been a unit learning this together. And so in that sense, it was perfect, you know, um, for us to just come into all this as one. And so I think it was perfect. It was perfect. I say terrible in the sense that I, I'm just remembering <laughs> the times that we went through, which I do count as precious because they really were. Yeah. But geez, they were challenging. Yeah, you were you were stubborn and I was. Mean, I was very stubborn. But it's okay. We're better. <laughs> we're better now because of it. Yeah, we are. Tom, I don't really, I really don't want to leave you out of this conversation. Now. I'm just enjoying listening. <laughs> you were a bystander at that time. What, what, what did you see as you were watching this go through these struggles? Well, the main thing that I noticed is that neither one of y'all were going to give up on each other. I noticed every time that y'all had, I guess, a religious battle and talked it out. At the end, y'all were both still happy with each other, and y'all just knew that. No matter what it was, y'all were going to overcome it. Y'all were just going to stay together, and that's what we all hoped for. We could always just see how happy y'all were together, and we all loved Nicole, and we wanted her part of our family. Oh, and, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice to see that you are a part of our family after yeah. all these years, and yeah. we're all growing together now. Yeah, so it's an amazing journey. Um, once again, I, I feel like I say it too much, but at the same time, not enough. I'm just appreciative of, of where we are in this growth process. I'm appreciative for the New Covenant group, for Dr. Jones, for, for leading it off and getting things started. And uh, just, just thankful to be here. Um, the things that, uh, that are being taught um, these days, like I said before, could be considered extremely controversial, which they are, but they shouldn't be. This should be something that we're all willing to just open up and talk about. Um, these are the things that we base our life on. I know that growing up, I was I was programmed or taught or brainwashed, however you want to put it, to <laughs> just take the things that you're being taught uh, and hold on to them dearly, hold on to them for dear life, you walk in them, you trust in them. And I still think that's a good practice, but I caution everyone to think hard and to study hard on what it is. Yes, very objectively, thank you, for, um, for what it is that you're being taught these days and what you're living by, because if, if you're going to base your life on this, if you're going to say, I'm going to walk the direction that God wants me to walk, I'm going to try to be who, who he expects me to be or wants me to be, um, we really need to know who he is. Yeah. We really need to know how he operates and how he designed us up to operate. And it, it needs to be of utmost importance. And so. And it doesn't need to be just something that we hang on to because that's what we were taught as children. You know, well, my mommy taught me that, you know, this is the way God is, but... If we learn otherwise, and it's been proven, then we need to to gain new ground and to grow. Always be always be open for change, and that doesn't mean be gullible. <laughs> you know, don't just buy into anything that anybody says. But I feel like that that's what we've done most of our lives. I was not gullible with this. Well, no, not with this. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think any of us were. No, I mean, I no. remember questioning everything <laughs> to the point where. I shut my ears because I was so, I'd heard enough. This is not it. You know, this is not the way God is. I mean, do you remember how yeah. bad that was for me? I mean, I do. And the funny thing I is, took it is too that, far. The funny thing is, is that we were, we're going to say something. I was just going to say that that's, that's what I love about being part of this and being part of the place is that you can ask as many questions as you want and you're going to get an answer until it makes sense. It's not a... Uh, it's, it's never just believe it or just go with it. It's, it's going to make sense. It's not the, the pretending thing, the pretend faith. You know, just go on faith, just believe it. You know, I was going to say that about you saying gullible a while ago. Um, it seems like we were gullible in the past, but yeah. when it came to the part, this part, we fought so hard against it. Yeah. You know, oh, well, God really can't be that loving. He really can't be in all. He can't be the father of all. You know, Satan is the father of some. 
you know. <laughs> yeah. There is a hell. There is a place of torture. We were gullible enough to believe those things, but when it came to the opposite, that was hard to swallow. Yeah. You I mean God really does love us that much? He's really not going to send me to hell for this or for that? It's kind of embarrassing. You know? I think that's what's made it more real for me. You know, one, it's been proven, but even in my state of mind years ago learning these things I wasn't going to take it as this is the way God is this is the truth you know I, I fought and you know it's sad thinking back about how bad I didn't want God to be so good you know it doesn't even ugh, it sounds horrible it just didn't seem fair to be honest that yeah you know i tried to be good so i tried so hard to be good and do the right things and i've earned this but there's other people that haven't earned it they yeah. have they weren't this good you know somebody you know there has been at least one person that's killed in this world and he's going to make it to heaven you know the murderers the, the adolf hitlers you know they're going to make it to heaven that's not fair mm -hmm. and that's sad yeah. It's really sick, you know, because I think about my kids now. I've got three. And I think, you know, sometimes Hannah will be wonderful, sweetest little girl ever. Mike is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> but which one of them would I say I would not want to share and what I have for them, you know, my household, my kingdom, if you want to call it that. Um, I want them all to participate. It doesn't matter how bad they act one day or how good they act one day. They're my kids. I love them to death. I mean, and you know, that's the kind of God and Father that we have mm -hmm. is the one that loved us unto death. You know, he, yeah, he did die. He wasn't for the reasons that we were always taught. You know, we, we were always taught that he died to save him from, save us from himself. This vengeful God that um, couldn't stand uh, the sin in us and, uh, he needed an atonement. He needed a perfect sacrifice. And since there wasn't anyone perfect, you know, he himself had to come down and do it. And that doesn't even make sense to me. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to come down and die for myself because I'm the only good one here and all you are rotten. So I'm going to prove how rotten you are by doing this myself. But that's not how it happened at all. He came down to show us the relationship that he had with us, the love that he shared. He wanted us to experience that firsthand. You know, he came down at a particular time when they had a terrible view of him. And when he showed himself, they were the ones that rejected him. And instead of him fighting back or being this big angry God that he was that he's depicted to be in the Old Testament, one that uh, will wipe out nations because, you know, they don't believe in him or they're not doing exactly what he told them to do. Instead of being that God that just wiped them all out, he said, you know what, I'm not going to lift a finger towards you because you're my children. Yeah. Even if you do want to put me on a cross, you know, even if you say my law requires a sacrifice, it's, it's not the way it is. I'm going here because I love you. I'm allowing you to do this because I love you. And for so many years, we were taught that we didn't deserve anything good, that we were unworthy of his, even of his love, you know, but we didn't deserve anything good. Anything good in this world was because of God. I mean, all these things that we just, just made us feel like we didn't deserve anything. When in reality, we deserve everything good because He is our Father. Just because of that. Just like our children deserve everything wonderful because they're our children. And we want to do everything we can do to make them happy because they're our children. You know, there's such a correlation, but somehow in the mix, it was separated you know it, all of a sudden we look like better people we look like better parents Thank than god, god. <laughs> yeah yeah that's a lovely mindset to feel like you're better than better than god <laughs> right but tommy can interject anytime you want i, I feel like i'm sitting with my back <laughs> to you but <laughs> you're still here and anything you have to say but um yeah anything everything we've been stating or the past few minutes is kind of what this morning was about um you know to our viewers i hope y'all followed this morning because this morning's teaching was awesome and uh one thing i don't want to pretend to do is uh represent a teaching from this morning the way dr jones did oh, there's <laughs> he, no way he opens his mouth and just 
information and, and truth and knowledge just comes out. Um, but I do feel honored to be one of the students and to, to be able to share like this and talk about the things that we're learning and being taught, you know, and, and the way I see it coming out. Um, so this is awesome, but, you know, I'm talking about worthiness and sinfulness and, and everything. You know, this morning he, he was in John chapter 8, and he talked about uh, the woman who was caught in adultery. And um, all the Pharisees and the scribes, they were ready to, they were ready to stone her. Yeah. Because she was caught in adultery. And um, so they, they, they carried her, or they brought her to Jesus and uh, explained the situation to him. You know, the Mosaic law demands that we stone this woman because she was caught in adultery. What do you say? You know, and I, I, love, I love the way Jesus handled this. It's just so awesome to me. You know, I mean, they're hurling these questions at him and everything, and he just bends down to right on the ground. <laughs> I don't know if there's some sort of meaning behind him doing that or if that was just the way a Jewish culture reacted to certain situations. I highly doubt it. I think it was just Jesus being himself, God taking his time and, and handling people. And um, he just stooped down, and they just continued to question and question. So he stood up, and even if it happened exactly like this or not, it's just a neat picture in my mind. But uh, he stood up and turned around and said, you know, if any of you have never sinned, if you've never committed any, done anything wrong, according to your theology, then uh, y'all pick up the first stone and throw it at her. And then he just stood back down and started writing. It was, we're talking about thousands and thousands of years of theology, of um, uh, philosophy, of who they thought God was and how they thought he was, Mosaic law and all of that. In 10 seconds, one little statement, it was all thrown out the window. I mean, he shut them down just like that. They were ready to stone her to death. But what happened? Each one of them, starting with the oldest, dropped their stones and, and walked away. And in the end, he stood there and said, who, who is it that condemns you now? Where did they go? You know? And she said, no, they've all gone. And he said, well, I don't condemn you either. You know, and, and the more I think about that, you know, they all had sin, uh, according to their theology. Um, they, they had all done things that they knew were against the Mosaic Law and knew that they would be worthy of the stoning, according to that philosophy. So they all walked away. But here stood one that if that philosophy were true, you know, the philosophy that if you've done this, you deserve death, you deserve this penalty and all of that, if that were true, who was the one that was standing there that was sinless? It was Jesus. Right. And he didn't condemn her. So that states one thing about that philosophy, but at the same time, he took that philosophy of sin and threw it out the window meaning I never looked at you that way anyway. Right. There was no, there was no de deservingness of punishment or stoning or death or any of that. So he was dealing with a much larger issue than what they were. They were just looking at her as a sinful person, a sinful human being worthy of death. When they realized, according to their own philosophy, that they were all in that same boat, they turned around and walked off. I find it interesting that when you look at that story, you have so many people that think that, oh, times have changed so much, you know, we don't view things that way anymore. But <clears throat> we, we really kind of do. I mean, as Nicole stated a while ago, when we were first learning about how loving God really is, it was just so hard to grasp that He really is that good. And that's why these Jews were so aggravated at the time, because they couldn't stand that He just wanted to just let it go and love this woman instead of punish her for sinning. But we all sin. And people today just, they just want punishment and not love. And they refuse to see God for how loving He really is. I always get chill bumps when I hear that story. Even before um, knowing God's true character, um, 
just the story, the way it's laid out, has always been beautiful. You know, Jesus handling it the way he did. You know, I think he was pretty gutsy to to handle the Pharisees the way he did. Um, but, you know, here we have this woman who, had they not ran into Jesus, could have been gone, you know, could have been stoned to death because of the sin that she's not the only person that's committed, you know. But when they presented her to to Jesus, you know, he handled it, just like you said, so delicately um, and proved that, you know, they can't condemn you because they're guilty of sin and I don't condemn you and I'm God. You know, I mean, it, I don't know. It's just, it's always given me chill bumps. Yeah, it's, it's an awesome story when you understand what was really going on there, you know, and to take it a step further, we, we talk about sin. Um, but what we understand about God's character is that He is love. And what we understand about love is that it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. So if God never, if He's, if he's always loved us, then He's never kept a record of wrongs. So therefore, when he looks at us, he doesn't see sinful people. He doesn't even see sin, because he he, he never kept he never kept that record. You know, when he looks at his children and he sees that they have problems, he sees sees them as just possibly being different, being a little bit outside of his character, or being sick. You know, the right. way we look at a at a sick person, we think. Well, most people, anyway, when I look at someone who's sick, I have compassion. Yeah. And I think, man, I feel really bad for them. I don't want them to be in that position. And if there was something that I was able to do to get them out of that, I would do it. But being that God is a physician, He is able. <laughs> and and that's what He does for His children. He doesn't, look, he doesn't view us as sinful beings. He wasn't standing there looking at that woman going, oh, you're a sinner, but I'm going to forgive you, or I'm not going to condemn you like these other people did. He looked at her and said, I don't see anything wrong with you other than you're a little bit sick. You have you have a philosophy in your mind that's not quite correct. Exactly. And, you know, when he made the statements, and, and once again, like I said, I, I cannot explain these things like, like our, our teacher can. You know, I, I'm, the way I base what I see as truth is on on the logic that I understand and the, the morality of what's being stated. You know, I, I can't go into the text and, and read the language in Greek and um, translate. I can't do those kind of things. I'm incapable of that. I have to trust the one who knows. Um, but morally speaking, do I think she deserves to be stoned? No. Logically speaking, do I think she deserves to be stoned? No. So that this particular teaching made so much sense this morning because just because of the logic and the morality and the sanity involved that, that Jesus was bringing amidst the insanity of these people who, you know, men who probably had three or four or maybe ten wives at home. Yeah. You know, I mean, what do you consider that if not adultery? <laughs> Something I was going to say and is it's interesting how they bring the woman who committed adultery but it takes two to commit adultery. Where was the man involved in that? Exactly. It was a very sick philosophy that they had, and I use the word sick intentionally, not sinful, because I think sin is just the term that man has created um, to make themselves or make others look bad or feel bad about themselves, but God yeah. never wanted that for us. And um, when, when Jesus was dealing with the situation, like I said, he didn't see a, a sinful woman, he saw a sick woman, you know, and what he did was tell her, go and sin no more in the English text, uh, but what we what we heard this morning is that the idea there was not about her being a sinful woman, but that this whole idea of sin theology that was going on at that time, you know, the, the way the, the Pharisees viewed this woman was a sinful woman. And what he, what he was really saying was, let's take this whole theology of sin and don't live by that anymore. You know, because I'm sure that that woman was raised in the same theology that the men were. Well, and it was the same theology that brought her to almost her death, you know, right. to be stoned. Well, that's a philosophy that they all had in their minds that they dealt with sin when it didn't need to be dealt with. You know, I mean, there wasn't... God, God never... 
he never dealt with sin itself. He dealt with this theology of sin when it came, because this theology didn't, I call it theology, but really I think that that might be an improper term. And let's call it philosophy, <laughs> yeah. because it was not of God. It was, it was a philosophy that man had created. And God said, this philosophy is not correct. Let's take this philosophy of sin and get rid of it. Don't live by this philosophy anymore. That's what he was saying. Don't go and beat yourself up about these things. Don't go and condemn other people about these things. Instead, let's let's heal this situation. What did he do when he proved to that woman that I don't view you as sinful? And if these men are going to view you as sinful, then they need to turn the finger towards themselves. Exactly, because when when they brought her to Jesus, you know, they were presenting Jesus with the Mosaic Law. You know, they were like, what would you have us do? Um, and so when he was presented with this Mosaic Law, what did he do? He threw it down to the ground. He wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna go with it. And so that was tied in really well, I think. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's funny. I, I, I have a problem with locating scriptures when I'm trying to think about them, but <laughs> one thing that Dr. Jones brought out this morning is how a lot of people will argue that um, Jesus came to fulfill the law because you can get that idea from our English text that he, he came and fulfilled every facet of the law, but right here you see clearly that he was tossing it up. He was taking it and setting it aside, and this is not me. This is This is a mosaic law this is something that man has come up with that's in matthew five seventeen, when it says i did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill and so i I took notes on that this morning because i it was so um refreshing because when he even says you have heard it said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth and uh love your neighbor and hate your enemy you know but i tell you and all these things he's like but i tell you but i say you know, you've heard this, but this is what I say. Right. And when you say that, you know, who was it speaking? It was very God himself. It was God. And mm-hmm. he was saying, you've heard it said. In other words, you didn't hear it from me because this is what I'm telling you. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that is that if you turn back into, I believe it's Exodus that has most of the law in it, it quotes that it's from God, but... Obviously, Jesus corrected that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. But um, there's just so many, so many wonderful things brought out this morning. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love how Dr. Jones can take one verse of scripture and talk about it forever <laughs> and go <laughs> and so, get so much out of it. But you know, well, we used to we used to read these very scriptures and. I, it's, I, sometimes I struggle with what did I used to think that meant. Yeah. What, 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 what did I used to think about that scripture? I and, think that's uh, the problem. I think we just didn't think about it. Yeah, that's a good, very good point. We <laughs> I was going to say think. that. We were just told, and <laughs> uh, okay, that's what that must be what it means because Pastor said so, or Uncle Bill, or Daddy, <laughs> or whoever you <laughs> whoever you're listening to at the, at the time. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, you know, um, he tied it into um, the passage about Jesus taking on sin. I can't even remember where that where that was, but you know, leading up to it, um, I quoted it. He said, "Did Jesus become sin?" And I put in parentheses a transgressor. And yes, he did, because his walk was getting people out of. The Mosaic Law, and so technically, he was sinning, according to <laughs> according to their Mosaic Law. You know, he um, told the man to pick up his mat and walk, and that was on the Sabbath. And he picked firewood on the Sabbath. Um, you know, so all these things, and you know, the uh, adulterous woman. You know, um, he was constantly pulling people out of that, and so very much so, he was he was sin if they wanted to label him that. Right. That's an awesome, awesome point because, um, you know, when they viewed Jesus in person there, it was impossible for them to see God because the idea that they had of who God was was totally being eradicated through Jesus' walk. 
you know, that's why they got so frustrated and so mad because for one, they couldn't argue with what he said, but here he was breaking all these Mosaic laws. And so that's what they went by when they killed him. Well, he's breaking the law. He's breaking the law. He's going against God. But that's all they could say. They couldn't argue. You know, so eventually they just had to shut him up by killing him. This is their only, their only option. But, you know, awesome point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, because <laughs> it's funny that you could say Jesus was a sinner, but according to what the Mosaic law said was sin and what was a transgression, Jesus went against that. So technically, yeah, he did. He transgressed the Mosaic law, but it wasn't his law. It wasn't his. He never went against his nature. Right. He never went against who he really is. He just right. went against man's idea of who he was. And the whole idea of him being on this earth. Um, according in my perspective is just that you know there was so much um, false information about who he was and even this morning I was getting a little emotional about um, just him expressing himself to the adulterous woman I'm sorry <laughs> um, you know he fought so hard to express himself to people and they still just killed him because of it. You know, I mean, to look at Jesus as a sinner is something I never thought that I would say. You know, <laughs> but even even at that, it's just according to them. Right. You know, he was in the wrong. Um, but it makes me love him even more. It makes me appreciate what he tried to do um, to get these people out of that thinking because it's so toxic. You know, it they were killing people they were killing their own kids they were killing anybody that came against them and you know god doesn't want that you know that's not who god is and he to came down to to express himself you know to me the worst part about that is that they were saying that it was god commanding them to kill yeah and that's that's very sick yeah, yeah. It really is you know but what comforts me about it is, you know, I used to think, oh, poor Jesus, you know, he's in the midst of all these people that, um, you know, didn't understand him and couldn't see who he was, didn't have fellowship or whatever, you know, I used to think how sad, you know, to, and, I, and in my mind I was thinking, you know, he's amidst all these strangers, all these people that, you know, just really couldn't stand him they're claiming to serve him claiming to serve god but they didn't know him at all yeah but then when i step back and think as a parent the amount of love and the amount of compassion that i have on my children even when they're mistreating one another or possibly mad at me or mistreating me and it doesn't phase me it doesn't make me feel like um, unloved or unappreciated or or alone in the situation. I'm just looking at my kids, going, "Oh, you know." I've got to get them out of this. <laughs> yeah. But when I when you look at at Jesus like that, when he came down amidst all the this this sick philosophy, he was looking at his children. Yeah. You know, the the pain part I'm sure was pretty uncomfortable. For him, he physically felt the pain that he went through. He physically felt the emotions. But once again, he was among his children. These were not strangers to him. These were not like, oh, well, those Jews back in that day, like they are to us, just so far off and so, uh, you know, I don't even have a concept of, of how they were. I mean, slight concept, but you know what I mean? I, I can't relate to them because I don't know them. But Jesus did. He already had a relationship with them. It was them that rejected him. Yeah. It was them that didn't want that relationship with him. But when I think about him walking around looking at his children in that manner, you know, just treating him with such love and compassion, and I, I, I don't know, it's just, it amazes me because, I, like I said, I used to think of him just, oh, poor Jesus, walking around and all these unfamiliar faces and unfamiliar people. No, he knew them intimately already. They were his children. Yeah. 
you know, I don't feel uncomfortable around my kids, even when they are hollering at me or <laughs> whatever they may be doing that's coming against me. I don't feel uncomfortable. I don't feel like, oh, well, these people, I don't even know these people. Just, you know, get them out of here. I don't want nothing to do with them. He wasn't like that, you know. Yeah. He, he would just, compassion and love just flowed out of him. And you notice, you know, even towards the Pharisees, he didn't lash out at them either, um, you know, for them trying to stone this woman. Um, you know, and I, I do connect it to uh, parents and children, you know, and our children are coming at us with a spiff and they're fighting and screaming at each other. Um, you know, I just want them to all calm down and to all think about what they're doing and what they're saying. And, you know, you can easily, as humans, we can get onto one more than the other, but I thought that Jesus was very tactful. You know, it's kind of like what we've been taught about raising our kids. You've got to outsmart your children. <laughs> you know, I feel like that's what Jesus was doing with the Pharisees. Um, you know, he was outsmarting them. You know, he could have just said, no, you're not going to stone her, go. You know, but let he who is without sin throw the first stone. You know, he didn't have to say anything else. They left. And so, I don't know, I think it's pretty neat that, um, you know, he's very tactful and very... Um, smart <laughs> in the way yeah. he deals with his children yeah it's it's amazing um speaking of dealing with children um, you know we talked a little bit about this last week uh, just the ideas that you have about how you're going to raise your children and my children aren't going to do this they're not going to do that i'm going to make them be this way or whatever you know and, and the harsh discipline that people use towards their children you know break out the rod or the belt you know just things that I used to think that I would do to my children. But that doesn't teach them anything. I mean, we're no better than the Pharisees if we're raising our children that way. Oh, well, they right. got caught in the sin. Let's beat them, punish right. them, you know. But what did Jesus do? He didn't beat his children. <laughs> right. didn't lash out on them. He didn't punish them in any way. He spoke to them. He made sense. Whether they understood it or not, that's what he did. And, you know, that's the approach that I've tried so far. And you're a lot better at it than I am <laughs> with our kids <laughs> to just talk with them. One day you will understand this, and I hope you take notes. <laughs> just Not in any hurry. <laughs> <laughs> talk with your children. Yeah. You know, explain things to them. Explain to them where they're at, where they're doing wrong, and talk to them where they are. You know, I have a a five-year-old, well, almost five-year-old, almost three-year-old, and a five-month-old. Um, I, I try to bring, to the best of my ability, bring things down to their level in a way that they'll understand. You know, they don't understand me coming in there and hollering and yelling, and I'll say that I've never done that, because I have, but it's always regretful afterwards. I'm like, what was the point in that? You know, they didn't get anything out of that. Just like if you came into a room yelling at me, I wouldn't understand it. I'd be like, <laughs> so why would a five-year-old Get exactly. It. You know, why would anybody understand me bending them over and paddling them or, or an adult walking up and punching them in the face because something they did wrong? You know, I mean, it's our idea of upbringing and teaching is just, mine has changed dramatically since we've come into this. Um, you know, and yeah. I, I, I try to think and I can't even imagine, but. I've, I've tried to think a time or two, where would I be if, you know, we hadn't crossed paths with Dr. Jones, we hadn't crossed paths with this message and been brought out of all the, the garbage we were in. Um, I don't even want to find out. You know, I don't want to know. I don't know what, I don't want to know how I would be treating my children right now, even if I would have gotten married and had kids, you know, I, I don't know. But I, know, I can say this, that I love life now more than I ever have. Um, I appreciate everything that God has given us more than I ever have. I feel better about myself and those around me more than I ever have. I don't feel, um, that's what I'm looking for, a lack of self-worth, you know, yeah. being shoved down by religion saying you're not worthy of anything. You know, the only reason God loves you is because he had mercy on you and he decided to and there's nothing good about you. No, we're his children, and we deserve everything that he's given us. Yeah. Just like my kids deserve everything that I can give them. Everything, you know, I, I work day in and day out to 
provide, and it's a joy to do that because I want to bless my kids. I want to give them everything physically possible that I can because I want them to have a good life. Yeah. And what makes us any different from God in that aspect other than the fact that he's so much better at it? Yeah. <laughs> So much better at having compassion on his children and, and loving his children and, and sharing and giving. And that's the direction that we're headed as a group is just loving, being compassionate, patient, and getting rid of all of this old theology or Correct. philosophy, this old philosophy of um, non deserving, hell, uh, whatever it is. You know, just, I don't know amazing but yeah. I think that we should start wrapping things up here pretty quick Tom is there anything that um, you want to add to or say I'm pretty much in agreement with everything y'all said <laughs> y'all, y'all said it all well I'm glad you're here with us this evening I appreciate you sitting in on it uh, sitting in on us sitting in <laughs> with us <laughs> um, I've enjoyed it and I always enjoy having you um, it's a blessing. And um, is there anything you want to add or say? Um, well, I did enjoy this morning's teaching. And like I said, um, you know, just having this view of God has changed my life. You know, like you were just talking about, it changes everything, every aspect. I think you named all the aspects <laughs> of life. It does change you. You know, it changes us. And... Um, you know, I don't know where I would be as a person without that change. You know, I think that I would be very much different. And so for that, I'm so, so thankful. And, you know, me being here tonight is not something that I'm always comfortable doing. You know, you know me, I'm not one to speak in front of people or even just share my opinions. Um, but if this is all I can do to help anybody, you know, to help spread the message, and I want to do it. You know, I want to be here. I want to participate, and I hope that uh, we can just continue to hear more participation from the group and uh, get more people involved with us. I will second that. (laughs) Beautifully put, Um, but I, for one, have always had issues. You know, growing up, I was extremely shy. Um, and then into my teen years, I've always just had a, an issue with public speaking, with getting in front of a camera or behind a microphone. And for some reason, I just keep finding myself <laughs> put in these positions where I have to speak and whatever. But anyway, I, I enjoy it. It is an honor. And uh, I hope that I have uh, spoken in an understandable way and, and blessed somebody. And I do, I do want to... Uh, um, say thanks to our listeners. Um, Dr. Jones was talking to me before the show this evening and um, was telling me how, how many people there in the, the Florida studio, um, you know, were asking about when is our show and you know how much we, our show blesses them, and uh, that's that's awesome to me. I, I'm so thankful and uh, I appreciate all of you guys, the Jones family, Miss Ruth, everybody that's participating in this and striving hard to watch our portion of the show. It really means a lot. Um, and I will say this, you blessed, you guys have blessed me and all of us here more than you'll ever know just by, you know, I know we don't get to see you a whole lot or even speak a whole lot, but the testimonies that I hear coming our way from, from Florida, they're awesome. And we appreciate all the work that you guys do, all of the support that you put in, all the time that you spend, um, for this show, for this program, for this message, for this group, for our whole purpose here. It's awesome to just see people give and give and give and give until there's just no more in them to give. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and um, it's a huge encouragement to us here in Texas. And so we feel so much a part of what's going on down there, you know, just through this show, you know, being so connected with the Florida group. It's pretty neat. It is it's really neat. It's really encouraging because it, I don't know if anybody has ever experienced any type of long-distance relationship, but usually they're pretty difficult. You they know, usually they're... suck. But, <laughs> but this Can is you not... say that? No, <laughs> <laughs> long, long-distance relationships 
usually are difficult. It's hard to keep in touch. It's hard to know what's going on. But I don't know. There's just so much joy and so much um, participation that it makes this a lot easier than I thought it would be to, to participate and to stay close connected. To be a part. And I, I, think, I think it's because of how significant and how awesome of a purpose this is. Um, and how, how much each one of us wants this message to reach the world. You know, just to yeah. be able to share our hearts with people, to let them know that here at the place we're comfortable, we're relaxed, we want the participation, we even want the adversity, not, not so we can argue and bicker, but just so that we can lay all of our issues out on the table and say, let's discuss it. It's dialogue, not monologue. And, you know, I don't want anybody to just feel like they got to sit here and listen to me talk. And I know Dr. Jones has stated many, many times he is not interested in monologue. This is not a show just to come and hear him and, you know, he's the man and all this. He wants dialogue. He wants, you know, if you have issues, if you have questions, get involved. You know, Facebook, text, help me out with the number. You've got a better memory. 850. Five seven two seven four four one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Text your questions in. Um, and also tonight um, at eight o'clock, Ivan Rogers will be on, and he authored a book um, called "Dropping Hill and Embracing Grace," and so he'll be on at eight o'clock. And I, I have yet to hear him speak, um, but I hear he's. He's just an awesome person all the way around, and I'm really looking forward to that. So, 30 minutes from now. Yeah, 30 minutes. Stay tuned. Please you know, join in on that show. He'll be speaking with Dr. Jones and, and Rhonda, I believe. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, stay tuned. We appreciate you guys listening in with us. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope, hope uh, we've ministered to you in some way. And uh, continue to follow us, and hopefully we'll see you next week.